Welcome friends to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. Welcome everybody to Someone Gets Me. We have a great guest today. His name is Paul Ill. Today we're gonna talk about the power of music in all of its varied ways. And really we could talk to Paul about that for a very long time, but let me just tell you a little bit about him. So you will begin to see the depth of conversation we're going to have. Paul is a graduate, graduate from Berkeley College of Music, where, um, and he was a studio bassist where he played in recordings of over 20 million records. So if any of these names sound familiar, Paul has played with them. Tina Turner, Annie Lennox, Linda Perry, Courtney Love, Christina Aguilera, Alicia Keys, Pink, and the list goes on. So Paul's been around. He's a songwriter. He plays bass. He's a studio musician. He is somebody who is highly sought after for his skill set and his knowledge and his passion for music. But wait, there's more. He's also a published author. And he's currently taking his music into the realm of personal transformation to help all people and especially other musicians and musically inclined people really connect in a way that is unique and different and powerful. Paul and I have known each other for, we're just thinking about 10 years. And the moment we met each other, it was this dynamic conversation and we have stayed connected um, for quite some time. Paul is in California, I'm in Florida. And so from the magic of Zoom, we get to welcome to the Someone Gets Me podcast, my good friend, Paul Ill. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Diane, for having me. I'm honored and humbled and blessed to be here. I'd like to kick things off this uh, afternoon or morning or evening, whenever you're watching this thing, with a get happy baseline. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. Get happy. That's one of the things that music does. It really does connect people with a basic happiness. One of the uh, experiences I share with people is a way, a means by which they can, in the moment, um, manage anxiety without having to dig in the dirt or do any problem identification at all. And it's called uh, GTR, it's Ground Track Resource, and it's it's, uh, it's a means by which an individual can practice self-care in the moment. Well, we want to transcend terms like intervention or stuff like that. Uh, it's a technique. And so what a person can do, and music, that particular baseline is probably liberally lifted from a Quincy Jones early 70s, um, you know, like, Bill Cosby or, or you know, uh, Fat Albert, Herbie Hancock kind of thing. Somebody in the early 70s probably wrote that bass line and I just absorbed it into my consciousness. And that bass line always makes me feel really good. It's just a groove. It's like you can walk and be happy to that. There are other resources. That's the R of GTR, ground track resource. A resource can be something like the face of your children, something that unconditionally makes you happy that's not based in some hedonistic temporary gift of happiness, like winning a lottery or something like that. Right. Uh, a resource can be something like your favorite animal or your favorite bird. And uh, so when we use ground track resource, what we do is we ground ourselves. If you get anxious in your car, or if you're at a business meeting, or if you're with your significant other and feel yourself getting 
uh, uptight or anxious, quite frankly. You track it and you ground yourself. First thing you do is, where are you? You're sitting in your car driving. Okay, my haunches are on the seat. My hands are on the wheel. Right? My head's against the headrest. If you're walking, it's just a feeling of your feet walking. You don't even have to stop. If you're in a business meeting, you can maybe put your hands on the table for a minute, ground yourself to the table, and ground yourself to the chair. First thing you do is you say, I'm anxious. I'm going to ground. We ground. Then we track. Where is the anxiety manifesting physically? We skip right past the psychological, the intellectual, the, the thinking, right. the right. cognitive component. We just put it in the body. Oh man, when I get anxious, my stomach gets tight and my chest, go, I, my, my shoulders go, my neck goes away. Okay, just know that. Don't even try to change it. That's where it is. You just track it. But the trick is you just immediately access that resource whatever it is, it could be your favorite song, it could be a memory of your prom date, it can be anything, it can be the beach, it can be the, like a lot of people, it's the face of their children or a loved one or something like that. Some people, it can be a uh, very lofty, it can be a very high spiritual ideal, like their relationship with the creator, you know, uh, could be very personal. Mine is usually a musical one. I also like dolphins a lot, like the face of a dolphin. If I remember this dolphin staring at me in this cove that I was in, uh, in North Florida, in, in the panhandle, off the panhandle, this cove. Um, and this tricky little dolphin was hanging out with us while we were water skiing and would just pop up and look at us. When I remember that moment, I can't be anxious. So what I want to start off with is ground track resource. This is a gift I can give all of Diane's uh, friends and, and, and listeners because Diane's giving me lots of gifts. So that's the gift. Oh, that's amazing. And it, it's so simple that it's easily doable by all of you guys, by everybody. You know, it's not something that's got to remember a thousand steps and what to do and what's right and what's wrong. We don't have to worry about any of that. It's very simple. Ground, track, resource, GTR. Empirically tested by the VA, with people coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, really great results with veterans, PTSD veterans. Right. So when you got anxiety or you have that where your brain's racing too much or things are going on, do GTR. You heard it here from Paul, my friend. <laughs> so Paul, tell everybody a little bit about how you got started in music. I mean, you, you have done some amazing things and you're really talented. And, but how did it all get started? I always love like, when did it start? Did you always, were you into music like when you were born <laughs> or how did this happen? Well, it, it did start in the home, but <clears throat> it was very interesting. There were two pre prevailing uh, systemic influences on me. One was my older sister who was six years older than me. She was what's known as a prenatal piano player. She was born knowing how to play the piano. It was very disturbing to her first two teachers. My family was living in Germany at the time. My dad was in the military and he was stationed there. So my sister was like four or five. I wasn't born yet. And she was so precociously piano fixated as a young kid. She used to go across the street to the neighbor's house and sneak into the house and their piano was locked and she would fall asleep with her arm hooked around the piano. She would like literally nap with it. And it happened twice. So my parents finally got her a piano because she heard it and she knew what it was. I still own that piano. Um, wow. So I grew up in a household with someone who by the age of 14 could play the Russian romantic composers, piano concerto, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Scriabin, Stravinsky, that kind of stuff from memory. And uh, she was a, a force of nature musically. She was incredibly talented where I objectively don't have that kind of talent inborn. Um, the other big influence uh, that was fostered by a very understanding parental dyad, my mom and dad were like, yeah, you guys want to do music, go ahead. I mean, they owned maybe 25 albums, LPs that they liked. They liked what they liked. They sang out of tune along with them and they enjoyed music, but, and they had their favorites, but it wasn't a, you know, musically driven household. It just, this daughter showed up, my older sister, and, and they just went, okay, go with that. So I had this 
person in my house as in my formative years who practiced three to four hours a day, five to six days a week, but was functioning at, a, at such a high level technically and um, emotionally, like her piano performance style when she was a kid was a lot like um, Tori Amos or Keith Jarrett, who are very, Elton John's really intense when he plays, Billy Joel's very this, you know, these piano players, you know, Leon Russell was very groovy. Tori Amos is in it, like another place. She's very physical and Keith Jarrett, my sister would go into a trance, her eyes would roll up in the back of her head. It was very sensual and very disturbing to a lot of people because of her age. It, it was not erotic at all, but it was very provocative. And it was it was a very unique thing to witness. And then, like, we were living in Maryland, and I was 10, and she was 16, or I was 9, and she was 15, Rubber Soul by the Beatles came out, and she was like, okay, this is, this is Brave New World stuff, basically. And she got a nylon string guitar, and there was this band down the street, these two brothers that were her age had a garage band, and I used to go there and watch them. It was before I owned any instruments or anything, but I was already musically obsessed. And they were really not being particularly nice to me that day. They, and I, I said, hey, what's going on? And they said, well, we're really pissed at your sister because she went to this Catholic girl's school. They went to Catholic boys' school and they all knew each other. They flirted and stuff. And, um, I said, I said, wow, what did she do? And she goes, oh, she got a nylon string guitar last summer. And she already knows all the songs on Rubber Soul. And they were like, they sit there with the record and try to learn Midnight Hour or whatever. They, right. She was miles ahead of most people. And the other influence was the Beatles, eight years old, watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, watching my sister flip out and totally get it because she was already a classically, she was going to Peabody Preparatory Conservatory in, in Baltimore at that time. And she was already pretty savvy. She's mm -hmm. folky, a big folky already. And, uh, she was like, wow, this is really cool. And watching her and her two friends who were older women, I was eight and they were 14 and 16, actually flip out. Like actually have a oh my God. physical reaction right. to the Beatles. They were already hip to Beatlemania and everything. And the energy in the room was very telling. Uh, I remember we were sitting at the dinner table. We were visiting some friends of my dad's in Washington DC, a coworker visit, very formal serious thing between military officer and this guy was a civilian intelligence guy i had a coat and tie on at eight like what is this and the big deal was baked alaska for for a dessert right you know it's gonna be part of ice cream it's gonna be lit on fire and right at whatever five day the older women the girls the 14 year olds were like we gotta go watch tv we gotta go watch tv and i was like what you're gonna skip baked alaska for tv what's that all right <laughs> yeah, go go do your thing and i'm uh can i go see what's going on and the parents were like yeah sure go but come back and get your baked alaska we went down to the tv room and they were freaking out they were shrieking they had bouffant hairdos the beatles started playing one of them pulled her hair out and shook her hair her sister wet her pants because of the release it was all that repression of the 50s and all that systemic oppression of women and sexuality and sensuality that that judeo-christian puritanical stuff just was wiped away in one song and i was sitting there going hmm i get it because we had already been across the atlantic and across the pacific so i'm knowing these guys are from england what it took to get them to the states they're playing music the bass player's name is Paul, and he's left-handed. I'm like, well, it's meant to be. <laughs> you know, I'm not kidding. When I met him, I thanked him. I, I got to meet him briefly, and I said, Sir Paul, lifetime debt of gratitude for the music. My name's Paul, and I'm a bass player. And he shook my hand, and he said, oh, bass player's name is Paul. I understand. You know, so that's where it started, and I eventually got a bass. Um, I took piano lessons, took cello lessons at Peabody Conservatory around that time, eight, nine, ten years old, the weekend program for kids. I was too kinetic after, a, I took music theory too, but after about a month, the staff was like, he's too much. I was too physically kinetic. Uh, I'm not into diagnoses. I'm not into naming it as whatever somebody might name it. I was just a very kinetic, very physically active kid, and it was really hard for me to focus. And... Uh, they asked me, they said, why don't you keep him at home for a couple of years? 
and they and my parents said okay because my sister's place there was she was on a track to a scholarship to Peabody Conservatory so I think there was a little the, the message was he's too hyper keep him home for a couple of years and we moved to Germany but be, but before we moved to Germany my mom uh, made sure that I had a bass guitar and an amplifier so in the seventh grade in Germany a couple of years later I had a garage band just like most of the people in my generation mm -hmm. but it was a basement band <laughs> with basement and uh we just jumped right in and i'm actually recording for seventh eighth ninth grade i had those guys in my basement i'm actually recording long distance with one of them right now 51 52 years later mm -hmm. and i just did a recording session for one right before the COVID outbreak here in los angeles he came into town from muscle shoals alabama where he lives and he's back in town. He's going to actually record for me. We're going to do a safe distancing session at my studio with him. So the relationships that began in junior high school, here I am fast approaching a retirement age. I'm going to be 65 years old in September. These relationships aren't restored. They never went away. They're just, they're, they're just rediscovered. So that's what's really cool about music is the healing nature of it and the relational relationships of it. I mean, it does make us feel good. It's a lot of fun. But as a means of communication and a means of human expression and a means of human interaction, it certainly can be a really good force in just about anybody's life. Sure. So I, I love how the relationships have maintained, like you said, you know, all of these years, that's like a half a century mm -hmm. of connection to somebody that started and was grounded in music and still is grounded in mm -hmm. music and that connection. And to me, that's like, there's a power there that's beyond cognitive. It's beyond words. It's just energetic. And it's so beautiful. So how did, when did the songwriting start? Like, how did that, when did that start coming in? I mean, were you writing songs when you had your basement band or was that a little bit later? Well, our basement band didn't have a singer. We had a sax player. And at that time and space, what was happening for kids was the emergence of bands like Cream and Jimi Hendrix, mm -hmm. where the instrumental experience was equal to the song experience of something yep. like the Beatles or popular music form. Um, what a song is, a song is this magical place where the lyric or the narrative intersects with a melody and it intersects with a track or a groove, the instrumental thing, where those three things meet and converge in some magical thing where they all work. That's what a song is. Whether it's, regardless of the idiom, that's what it is. Um, right. We were learning other people's songs. Uh, the first time I wrote songs for a band was later on in my teens, uh, and then in my early 20s. My I was writing a lot of poetry, mm. but I didn't perceive myself as a singer songwriter person. I po perceived myself as an instrumentalist, which was very interesting. It was a limiting narrative that for some reason I, I embraced at a very young age, which uh, was rooted in the basic lie that some personalities seem to be born with or grab onto that as I am, I am not enough. I was of the mindset that I always needed to have a singer in the band that was a really good singer, right? The, right. But Bob Dylan was very popular in our house and he was not a gifted singer. He's, you know, the poet laureate of the 20th century probably. And certainly lots of people love listening to him sing. But for some reason I had some distorted uh, valuation and I didn't pursue it. Uh, and then I started writing songs. The first songs I submitted to a band, I was in my early twenties and I was living in New York and I got very lucky. I was hired out of a, a it's detail rich unfortunately, but I was playing at a ski resort while I was going to college in Boston. And a bunch of us had left school for a semester to go make some money. And we were in Western Mass playing at a ski resort and a very respected, amongst musicians and very well known amongst musicians, a jazz guitar guitarist named Joe Beck hired me for his band and moved me to New York. 
and he wanted to start a rock band and he hired me and another person from Western Massachusetts. Uh, and we relocated to New York and he and a few other people, we, I submitted songs to that band and I would co-write with them, but I didn't sing them. Um, and then that began my journey as a songwriter. Most of the work that I've done that's proliferated, I've sold 24 million records roughly as a studio musician, four and a half million as a songwriter. The most, those, those records are all collaborations with the people that you named, some of the, you know, recognizable names where most of the work that I've done is there some form of collaboration. If I'm not actually sharing the narrative, the creation of the narrative with them, the creation of the music or the production of the music is done in collaboration. It's very interesting. Um, a lot of people don't sing what other people wrote. A lot of people have made a career singing what other people wrote. Right. Tina Turner, Linda Ronstadt, Joe Cocker from my generation of, of you know, so it, it can go either way. Um, but I was always writing poetry and always uh, writing um, short stories, never novels, but uh, uh, vignettes. Mm -hmm. Because another thing that a song is, a song really is a three and a half minute novel. Right, you, yeah. You look at the great songwriters that we all love of every generation, they can really take you someplace in a very short amount of time. It has a beginning, a middle, and end. It usually has a climax and has a denouement. There's some expression of an emotion that is complete that the person can hold on to. And even songs that I do not like, an artist that I do, don't like, I still have to, I mean, aesthetically don't like them. Right. They, they, you have to sit back and go, wow, that was great. Look at that story. It got told in three and a half minutes. Yeah. You know? It's, it's really amazing and powerful. Like I love, that's one of the things I love about music and especially songs that have these really powerful lyrics. And my mom was a concert pianist. And so I went to sleep to all the classics all the time and um, growing up. And that's where I really fell in love with instrumental music, especially saxophones and, and all kinds of big band kind of music. Like it was, it was so exciting for me to, just be in that energy all the time. I never really even understood it till later, till I was probably in college before I really started appreciating that gift that she gave me growing up, you know, of just like, that's just what our family was. And that's what we did. My brother used to play the bugle. He used to sit in the, um, when you were talking about being kinetic, my brother used to sit in the front yard at six o'clock in the morning in our neighborhood and play revelry and stuff and my dad would go out and go that I don't think the neighbors are really appreciating that right now you know and things like that but he loved doing that there's something about music that is just really amazing well so, if I may interject uh -huh. one of those things is is that there are a lot of people that experiencing music helps them make sense of the world around them it, yes. it's how they can explain things to themselves or uh, make sense of, a, of an experience that they're having. It's not only the soundtrack of their lives, which is basically accumulated in your coming of age experiences. Like most people, the, the music that they listen to in their late adolescence and, and, and uh, individuating years, like 18 to 25, roughly, that for most people becomes the soundtrack of their life uh, that, that has the most emotional resonance with them, like all the work that's done with Alzheimer's patients and dementia patients. My father's 97 years old and he still lights up when he hears the Mills Brothers or Tommy Dorsey's Big Band or something oh, like man. that. It's just the way the world works, um, the way the human condition is. There's a very important book that I like to recommend to people by a PhD, former record producer, from Stanford named Daniel Levitan. It's called This Is Your Brain on Music. And he also wrote a book, I think that was his PhD thesis. And then there's also a book called The World in Six Songs. So if you Google Daniel Levitan and look up him and read some of his stuff, YouTube stuff, it's really, he really helps you understand it. There's a fund of, about 10% of the population, time stops and the world becomes technicolor and completely easy to understand. If we're talking about something that's related to music or we experience music, like I can text my friends, my musician friends, 
uh, something, a change, a little change of one piece of hardware on one of my bass guitars or something, and time will stop for that. Right. You know, you're like, oh, what did you do? And we're just, we're not even experiencing music. We're experiencing the hardware around it. And it gets that electrochemical thing in the brain where everything's okay. And, and, and um, yeah. in today's current circumstances, it's really important, I think, for people to be um, embracing uh, music as a, as a healing force. And you're going to have to excuse me off camera. They're outside my home. Somebody is operating a machine and it's going to leak over audio wise. Excuse me just for a minute. Unfortunately, it's in the condominium above. Me. So, uh, well, we're doing the best. Are you we hearing? Can. Huh? Are you hearing any? Dist uh, I can hear. It. I hear it a little bit, but it's not real bad. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about this. Didn't, unexpected. Yes, that happens a lot. I was doing a video yesterday, and I was out on my porch, and the lawn people came by with their weed eater, like right by me, sprayed me with dirt. I had to stop what I was doing, <laughs> go clean up happens all the time but to pick our thread back up what happens is is that the brain is making new neural pathways and just rediscovering really favorable positive neural pathways when we experience music and then the other thing is we have to remember the socio-anthropological history of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with the aural phenomenon early in our gestation as as humans when we were in hunter-gatherer groups of 12 to 50 people the beat right and the voice were pretty much all they had for a while. There was a rhythm and usually, and there was a voice and it was, it was the means by which of, of telling a story of, of a oral tradition and making the what melody made the oral tradition more memorable. Yes. So you had the beat and you had the voice, which is why hip hop is so crucial and why hip hop and rap music had to happen because things had gotten really complex, right? Popular music forms had become a whole lot more than that. And hip hop and rap brought it back to its fundamental, the voice and the beat. And then we had dance, which was accompanied with music, which was not storytelling at first. Dance at first was an expression of sexual prowess and your health as a, as a, as a progenitor. That's what it was. It wasn't erotic. It was, it was, it was a demonstration of health and, and, uh, and your viability as a, as a breeding partner. So <clears throat> music has very, very deep roots in what we do. And Daniel Levitan wrote a second book called The World in Six Songs, where there, it, there's a basic premise. I haven't read it yet, but I've read the, uh, enough about it. I have a surface knowledge of it, you know. Um, apparently, there's only basically six songs, and everything is, a, you know, there's six basic roots of, of what a song, the content of a song is, and the purpose of the song. So I, I look forward to reading that book. Oh, that and, will be very interesting. I'm gonna, I think I want to read that book, because it's... Yeah. That's and my mom used to my mom used to say everybody has one hit song in them. She used to say everybody's a songwriter. It's just she said that everybody got really lazy with the advent of radio. Before radio, in most in most American homes, and it, and I know it's true in Hispanic homes, in South America, and Central America, in European homes, from talking to people about the history of their families, a lot of families would be the mandolin family the singing family, right? Gather around the piano and sing songs. We not only expressed ourselves, but we entertained ourselves and passed the time. It was a way of occupying time that was creative and beneficial. Music used to be a lot more functional in people's lives, but with the advent of electricity, a lot of us got, you know, it's just easier to press a button and hear it. They didn't do anything wrong. It was just evolution. And there's value in getting back to our roots and actually experiencing and playing and being in the music. And so I, I, thinking about a family that, I, that I'm working with right now, the father's a drummer, the mother is a vocalist and plays ukulele, and they have three young daughters. I think they're like five, four, and one or something. But now the girls, the, the two older ones, are getting into guitar and they're playing music. And that's how they spend most of their family free time is drumming and singing and playing music together. And um, she's making the decision to homeschool the children with all this COVID mess and just 
just have them all have the experience. And we were talking about how you can use music as part of the education that will really be valuable for the kids, not only in their own healing in the world, but just their connection to their parents. So I, it was, I was really encouraged by that honoring of them, of their talent. And I mean, the girls' names are all after songs. Like they've named their children from musical songs that they love. And it's just a beautiful family. So I, when you said that about the family singing, you know, being around the piano playing, I'm like, yeah, we did that when I was a child. My mom played all the time. And that's what we did if we weren't racing boats. I think there's value, great value in it. So I, I, I have a question about being a studio musician because I've met a many through our mutual friend and some other people that I know. And one of the things I'm always curious about is all the different personalities <laughs> of all the different people that you have to be able to work with and flow with and create with. And obviously not all of them are going to be completely vibing in the same direction with you, or maybe they might be a little tricky to deal with. So what does Paul do when you're in one of those situations where it's a little bit tricky or difficult, or it's just doesn't seem to be flowing together, but yet you have a job to do and there's things to happen. Like, how do you make that work when, you know, when it's not your own flow? I just, I'm always curious about that personality piece of it. <laughs> Don't take it personally is the first thing. Mm -hmm. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. Don't take it personally. Uh, and also there's, there's a prayer uh, I believe that the solution for every problem is spiritual first, then cognitive, behavioral, relational second. There's a prayer that started circulating. I don't know where it comes from. Everybody thinks it's different, but the prayer, I'm going to use the G word. I hope it doesn't upset anybody. I'm going to use the God word, but the prayer is called the set aside prayer. And it says, God, please set aside for me all the things that I think I know about whatever it could be, this recording session, this person who's being really mean to me, <laughs> this person who I think hates what I'm doing, right. this person who has other ideas and wants me to do what they want to do, even though I know what I want to do is better. <laughs> God, please set aside for me all the things that I think I know about you, this problem, and myself, this situation, and especially spiritual matters, so that I may have an open mind for a new experience of all these things. That's the first thing. It's like, I try to bring that sort of sense of like, I'm here to do a job and be of maximum service. Like, I was very lucky. I got in late in life, right as the door was slamming shut on musicians. I co-wrote the Studio Musicians Handbook with Bobby Ozinski for Hal Leonard Music Publishing in 2009. And it's not a particularly successful book because the idea of a studio musician is kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like an old idea. A lot of us are doing a distance sessions right now, just like Zoom, where people will send us tracks and we'll record over it by ourselves and then we send it back and they offer us revisions. I hire people to do that with my music. Right now I have um, people, I have tracks some in upstate New York and I've got a track over right over the hills in West LA somewhere. I'm not sure where my buddy's living right now because he, he's hunkered down at his girlfriend's place for COVID and he's he's going to sing one of my songs because he's such a better singer than me. And the song requires a really good singer. So we were doing distance sessions, but back in the day when there was like a really big group of people, you just can't take it personally and you have to be open-minded and you have to do this thing we call the phrase somebody coined. We're in service of the muse. We're not even in service of our own ideas. We're here to serve the muse. What's in the best interest of this song? If I come into a recording session with somebody and I brought the instruments that I think are appropriate for that kind of music, maybe they sent me the music before and I've made my charts. You know, it's not a, just a cold call. And there's, it, in the peak of the studio musician era, mm -hmm. there might be five to seven people in the room. Everybody's on the clock. If it's a union record date, it's a very expensive day. It's not expensive as expensive as making a TV show or a movie, but it's expensive, right? For the building and all the technical people. Right. So the last thing you want to do is not deliver, right? Because right. it's not, it's, you know, it just, it's not, 
acceptable. So sometimes delivering means you play and if they say, we hate that, they might use terminology like that. You have to make sure that this doesn't tell you that's, that they're saying, we hate you. What they're saying is, is they're doing their best to say that they don't like that and they want to something different. So the diplomacy kicks in. Do they have something that they want you to play? Or is it articulated? Can they write it out? They may speak in very subjective terms, like, can you play it a little more like so-and-so? I'll tell you, as a bass player, people want you to do the James Jamerson thing, which is Motown, okay. right? right. I can do um, uh -huh. just by practicing it. I'm not, in all, in, in, by no means do I suggest that I am as innovative, as musical, or as gifted as any of these people I'm about to name. This is all by osmosis and by just hunkering down and doing the work, playing a lot. Because I'm, like I said, I'm not that particularly gifted physically. I, you know, I know what my gifts are, but I have to work at things, right? A lot, unlike a lot of musicians that I know. But they'll say, Paul, do the Jamerson thing, because they hire me to do that, right? Right, or right. Do the McCartney thing, will you? You know, which okay, the Beatles made ten records, and then Wings made whatever, 10 records, and McCartney's been recording ever since Wink, so what do they mean? You've got to think, what do they mean in this context? Or, and also, did you bring the right tools for the job, right? Some of them have the tools there they want you to play. Or they might say, do the JPJ thing, Paul, the John Paul Jones thing, the Led Zeppelin thing, which I could do. Or they might say, hey, just be a fresh, funky fellow, which what that means is they want me to be the Muscle Shoals, Southern Soul guy right, that I think yeah. is that translates, okay? Right. Or they might say very specifically, we need something very postmodern. We want you to think like St. Vincent, or we want you to think like 90s um, Sonic Youth. You know, like, can, you gotta be able to play like that, which is completely different physical experience and Sonic experience, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be adaptable, but you also have to have your own identity. And a lot of the really virtuoso musicians, a friend of mine, a really close friend of mine, is the bass player in Alice in Chains, Mike Inez, who was also with Ozzy for a long time at heart. And he's just a great guy and super gifted. He can really play. Mike gets called for sessions occasionally, but mostly hard rock stuff because of his identity, his brand out in the world. He just did a symposium at my alma mater with uh, Steve, oh, gosh, I forget Steve's name, the, the, head of the, the new head of the bass department there, who's a very gifted jazz fusion musician with technical, what we call chops, way beyond most people, his ability to articulate things and stuff. And um, the bass player for Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, I'm having other scene in a moment, I can't remember his name, it'll come to me in about five minutes. These guys are very technically gifted and they have very distinct ideas. They don't get called for sessions, they say, because, because, they're, because of their virtuosity. The re and and they, where they could probably do it, right? The reason I get called is because people know that my recording catalog is very diverse. There's a lot of that mainstream pop stuff I did with Christina Aguilera, Payne, Kalisha Keys. Most of that is a function of Linda Parrott. But I've also done my work with her, but I've also done postmodern rock stuff with Courtney Love. I've done traditional rock and hard rock with members of the former members of the Rolling Stones and Black Sabbath, Mick Taylor. Bill Ward. Um, my own band, Uncle Dwayne's band, is an Allman Brothers Grateful Dead mashup band. And I'm a frequent guest with an offshoot of the Allman Government Mule. They've been around 25, 30 years. I live in that world, mostly. Right. Um, but the thing is, as a studio musician, you have to be able to have a, set, a skill set where the feel of the music feels really good while you're playing it. And the ideas that you're putting forth are in line with the song's intentions, which is what we call service of the muse. Because what the producer is trying to do is make a record, make a recording that's gonna reach the most amount of people possible at a certain level of integrity, okay? Which is like Daniel Lamois with Bob Dylan, Time Out of Mind, a record like that, which is this incredible statement, but it was a big popular audience. There are people one third my age in their 20s, half my age in their 30s, that list that as one of their 10 favorite records, right? Um, and so as a studio musician, the skill set that you bring is a lot of it is, is you have to have a big musical language and you have to be kind of like, you have to have an identity, but also be wallpaper sometimes. Right. Right. And you also right. have to know when to be charming and when to be silent, when to just be a company man. Sometimes your opinion or your ideas aren't warranted 
They're not going to want to hear your input. They're not going to want to hear your joke. They just want you to get in and get out. Other times, it's, they hire you for the hang. I mean, there was a record producer, Guy Chambers. He's brilliant. He did all the Robin Williams stuff, which was huge, 50 million records overseas. He used to fly me and Brian McLeod when budgets allowed for this to England. It's how I got to record with Tina Turner. Put us up at the Ritz Carlton. We got paid triple scale. And he did it just because he wanted two guys from Southern California there. He wanted the vibe. He goes, I like the way back. I like to hang with you guys. I mean, we played the way he wanted. And he would show people the difference. He would play the song recorded by English musicians, and he played the same song recorded by us. And he goes, see the difference? Like Mick Jagger used so many different rhythm sections on his solo albums because he had the luxury of doing that. And then you find sometimes the England guys are better for the song than the Southern California guys or gals, you know? Right. And, uh, you also have to be able to get behind the song like that. Sometimes you get a call, like, come down to the studio, you're recording. You don't know who the artist is. There is no prep. You show up and you go, whoa, it's these guys. Oh, man, that happened to me a couple times recently. I got to play. One of the last sessions I did was Mike Love from the Beach Boys, the singer, the lead singer of the Beach Boys, his first solo album in 35 years. And I had original Beach Boys tracks in my headphones without any, just the vocals and a click at the time. And I had the five original Beach Boys singing to me, stuff people had never heard. And I'm reading a chart that I had to write that day. They, they, they said, come on over to Michael Lloyd's house, the studio in Beverly Hills in his backyard. He said, here's your MP3 guys, go write your charts. So everybody scribbles out the song, right? You know, we put it up on them, we play and you go, that's the recording. And that was the first time I ever met Michael Love. I got to meditate with him in the backyard, which was really cool because the Maharishi taught him to meditate when he taught the Beatles to meditate. So uh -huh. it's this experiential thing where you, what level are you relating on, right? When is the right time to ask a guy, is it cool if I meditate when you meditate? Is it cool at all to ask him, right? And right. so I play, and on that record, I played on 12 songs over two or three days. They actually replaced me on three of the songs, two of the singles. I was heartbroken when I finally got the hardcover disc. It happened, this was like 2019. I was like, oh man, they replaced me. And the producer called me and very graciously said, we love what you played, but we did it differently. They wanted something that I, I made choices that they decided they wanted to make different choices. So at first you're like, oh, I'm so fired. They don't like me. They took me off the important songs. Like your esteem can take a real hit in the moment, but then all they're doing is doing it in service of the muse, right? right they're just right. doing it to make the best recording possible to reach the most broadest audience, right? And then then on the other hand, over here on this little shrine table I got over here, I've got letters over there from all kinds of people saying, you know, offering me thanks for my contributions to their recordings too. And I certainly wasn't fired. I mean, he called me back for more sessions after that, but it just wasn't meant to be. What I, what I played, wasn't meant to be in the recording. They wanted a different approach. That's all. Right. And it's the, sir, like you said, it's the service of the muse and don't take anything personally. And a lot of the people who listen to the show are, are very sensitive and a lot of them are empaths and it's very easy to get sucked into that statement about me, the person, when it has nothing about to do with you, the person, it's about the other person. It's about the person who's speaking and what the bigger picture is, whatever that might be, whether it's music or a business deal or another creative venture. And so that's, I think that's a very valuable reminder for everybody that, you know, you want to retain your own identity. And what somebody says is just simply about what they're trying to do to serve whatever the greater good is and whatever the project is. Mm -hmm. You know, That's right. and there's a saying in the flying community, uh -huh. and I have to I have to use a cuss word. I'll, I'll annotate it, and that in the flying community, people that land airplanes and take airplanes off that are responsible for the aircraft. It's in the military and in commercial aviation and in personal aviation. One f up is worth a thousand attaboys, which means you can land the plane correctly on an aircraft carrier at a, or at an international airport a thousand times. Everybody goes, attaboy, good job. But you make one mistake flying that plane and it cancels out all the good stuff you did because your life is at risk and the other people's lives are at risk. Well, with creative endeavors and business endeavors and relational endeavors, sometimes very sensitive people, very creative people, very people, people who are very in the moment emotionally 
we can personalize it, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that underlying misconception that as I am, I am not enough, right? right. That, that, which is, is not the case. That's, that's inaccurate, that you are enough in the moment. If they say, hey, what you did, we don't want, you're still enough, you know, mm -hmm. with, with respect to if it's a business thing or a relational thing. So that's really important because that saying from the flying community doesn't apply necessarily. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, and also, quite often, you'll hear people in the recording industry, the audio recording industry, we used to remind each other, this is not a pediatric hospital. There is no child on the operating table right now. Right. We're recording a popular song, right? We're creating folk art, commercial folk art. This isn't even... Perspective. <laughs> yeah, all due respect, this isn't, you know, Carnegie Hall, a very important performance of a Beethoven piece that's been around a couple hundred years. We would like to think that the song is going to have what we call some legs and proliferate. We call it an evergreen. Like it's always going to be there. Hopefully we make, somebody makes those kind of recordings. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves like, hey, everybody, chillax. Let's calm down. <laughs> it's okay. It's not a pediatric hospital. We just don't like the bridge of this song yet. We haven't found how to play it. Oh, your part. We're not sure if your part's working. Right. right. So a lot of it is context and context. Context, I've learned when I'm the leader on a record date, when I'm the contractor or it's my record or I'm kind of in the driver's seat just because it worked out that way. Mm -hmm. The context that you create is the feeling in the room. It's called your leadership style, right? What kind of leader are you? I had to scratch my ear. I have an ear inocular in one of the uh, things that makes life life on life's terms. I actually wear one hearing aid uh, in either ear throughout the day. But anyway, um, the context that you create, the feeling in the room, right. a lot of that's going to determine the outcome. And then the quality of the relationships is going to determine the outcome more than necessarily the skill set of the people involved. Like when I go to Michael Lloyd's house to record, at my age, with my track record, I'm the rookie. Like the other guys in the room are people like Lawrence Juber, who was in Wings with Paul McCartney, who's one of the top five performance acoustic guitar players. Most, you know, he's at a level of amongst aficionados of acoustic guitar performance. He's just shockingly good at everything he does, right? And, and a well-known international person. The other guitar player, John Jorgensen, is John Jorgensen. I mean, he's, everybody knows who he is. He's a huge Nashville, LA guy. Uh, the drummer is from Burt Bacharach's band. The keyboard player is from, who's one of the last Wrecking Crew guys when he was really young. And that's another thing for that if anybody's interested in studio musicians, just watch the Wrecking Crew documentary and the Muscle Shoals documentary on Netflix and you'll get the whole, most of the picture, right? But there are those of us who are also artists out in the world that are studio musicians. So our hero, for the most part, are people like King Curtis, the sax player that was Aretha Franklin's band leader while he was a big New York studio musician. But the biggest one is Dwayne Allman from the Allman Brothers, yes. who played on Wilson Pickett recordings, Aretha Franklin recordings, but went on to really codify a different way of playing improvisational rock music. He was truly innovative and his band leadership style, the way he led a band and the way his band produced a culture is the tribe of people that I come with. We're studio musicians like that. And a guy like Joe South who wrote Hush and he wrote, um, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. I, God grant me the, he puts the serenity prayer in the song, it'll come to me. But he was a studio musician. He played with Bob Dylan. He played on a lot of big Nashville records, but he wrote a bunch of hit records too. And he would go out and perform. Charlie Daniels was that way. Yes. You know, very big studio musician, but also had a career out playing. A lot of the New York 70s and 80s people, like Tony Levin, was a great studio musician who became Peter Gabriel's bass player and one of his principal collaborators. Steve Gadd, the great studio drummer, has been with Eric Clapton maybe for the last 15 years as his touring drummer. You know, that, that, that's the, the idea is what context do you create as a musician? What feeling in the room do you create? You know, are you welcoming? Are you easy to work with are you fun right <laughs> fun you know, fun can, is important <laughs> yeah can you loiter effectively because sometimes you're just going to sit there while other 
And, and can you loiter without looking at your, your phone? Right? Can you stay focused? Do you need to check your messages? Now, granted, if somebody has a family crisis or something, that's one thing, but right. how present are you in the moment, right? What, you know, and sometimes they just like you because they like your shoes, you know? Oh, that was great. Call him. He has cool shoes. I'm not kidding. You know, it could be, wow, that guy was wearing really cool shoes. Well, who should we get to play on that track? That guy was wearing the cool boots. That was, you look at, I've heard that literally and you go, you like his shoes? And they go, yeah, he, what they mean is they liked him. Is right, they, right, what, right. They don't mean get those shoes back in the studio. Right. They're just telegraphing you. We like that guy. Yeah. Because yeah. there's lots of people that are capable of doing what I'm doing. I mean, I bring my own thing to it, but so does Dan Rothschild. So does Ruben Carlson. So does uh, Chris Chaney. I mean, the, the other bass players in Los Angeles that are, studio musicians and performing musicians quite most and i'm not saying this with self grant most most of them are technically <laughs> better than me in a lot of ways i have my own thing but i can look at them and go gosh that's really great wow i wouldn't have thought to play that their creative thing is unique to them or their skill set is like, holy smoly now i have my own thing that people i'm sure have the same uh set of perceptions about me i'm not indicating that I'm, it's all, it's all very subjective and very ephemeral because we're dealing with creativity, but we're also dealing with creation of a product. It has to have licks. It has to proliferate. You want to do what's right for the, right. the, the it, artists and the song. It's it. And also nowadays, especially in COVID era, so much recording has moved into working at home on your workstation where somebody sends you a song, you do your part, somebody else is doing their part at their studio and they're either building it sequentially or they're doing it all at the same time and they're going to combine it. You know, they, they throw caution to the wind. I worked on a show called Fast Track to Fame, which was ESPN. The head of ESPN at that time wanted to do a show that was NASCAR meets American Idol. And we did 160 songs over the 13 episodes or whatever for the contestants. And we would have to do an arrangement. And most of it was contemporary country country rock, southern rock, very little pop, very little R&B, very little hip hop. And we would have to do arrangements of them on Monday. The song, the, the contestant would have three or four songs usually, right? Um, hopefully three, sometimes four. They, we would come up with an arrangement and a key for the contestant. So if NASCAR was in say Charlotte or Wilmington, North Carolina or wherever the race was, right, Indianapolis, the contestants would be there. They would send us their song choices for that week, the music producer on site there. We would get them, start learning the song in the key that they would do. The drummer would generate the drum track that day or Tuesday morning. He would send it to me and the guitar player. I would do it in my home studio, overdub the bass. And then the guitar player and the keyboard player would send it to this guy that would assemble it do the background vocals and play pedal steel guitar by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest, Thursday morning. Then on Thursday morning, the contestants would start rehearsing the songs for the uh, wh whatever day they ran the trials, which I believe was Saturday was race day and, or trials day and Sunday was race day. So we basically had a three to five day window to complete uh, four, you know, up to 16 songs a week. Right, right. right? All done digitally throwing mp3s around the country with nobody ever in the same room at the same time wow so that's a completely different skill set than the skill set required to be in a room with everybody where we go hey let's learn this song and come up with a good feel for it right right and that was a while ago that was one of the first shows to be done like that 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 was seven years ago wow eight years ago when technology finally allowed for people to work like that. Oh, that's amazing. I love hearing all these stories and I love the creativity. And I, and as you speak, I love to feel the synergy of all the different energy and the different people, whether it's all in the same room or working on the same thing differently or whatever it is. It's like the synergy of those things to me just kind of brings things alive. And so I'm sitting here going, Oh, that's so fun. That's so fun. So I have one final question. Because I know sure. I'm watching, I'm being conscious of your time. I'm just taking oh, up a sure. lot of your time. Um, but I have, well, I actually have two final questions. One is, you, um, 
what do you do for fun and to be grounded? Like what, do, what brings you joy and you like to do for fun? Swimming, which I can't do right now. Mm. Every, every, except if I swim in the ocean and I'm not a fan of swimming in the Pacific. It's, it's tricky swimming in Los Angeles County in the ocean, but I love swimming. Mm. I love hiking. Right. I like reading. Yes. Uh, I like um, collecting objects and housewares and music and clothes and um, cultural artifacts from 1969 to 1975 of either American or European origin. Um, I like um, music a lot, a lot of music stuff, mostly music. Music uh, stuff, right. Yeah, mostly music stuff I do for fun, which I'm lucky because I get to, um, and I like, um, I, I, I belong to a group of people we call ourselves psychonauts, like astronauts go into space. Right. We're psychonauts, we go into, the, we go into consciousness, mm -hmm. and we're non-pharmacologically based, and we look for ways to improve consciousness and alter consciousness without a pharmaceutical help. We nice. uh, do things like flotation tanks. I love we, it. We do growth holotropic breathing. We do music rituals. Um, we do meditation, a lot of us. And I do subjective research. I can't float right now either. My flotation place closed. It's one of the best in the world. It's like your Ritz Carlton with floating. It's called Just Float in Pasadena. Yeah. I mean, each flotation room is like a small studio. Like, it's amazing, unbelievable. And uh, I like I like um, psychic research and altering the consciousness non pharmacologically. I'm very committed to this in my work with people uh, that I do with music, narrative songwriting as a therapeutic tool, and also with non pharmacological non pharmacological interventions for um, addiction and mental health uh, uh, presentations i don't even like words like diagnosis anymore i like right. words like circumstance yes words yes. like context stuff like that oh my god that's amazing so if you were going to have a billboard that the entire world was going to see and your name was going to be on it what would you put on your billboard what a good question. Oh, I know exactly what I would do. I would copy the, the best billboard the world ever made. Sit right there. Uh-oh. I don't know where he's going. <laughs> this is an original. This was a billboard that was all over the world. It was also their Christmas card. Oh, war is over. The Yoko Christmas card. They printed 2,500 of them and smelled them out. Uh, a friend of mine named Claude Hain was their tour manager at the time. He was my tour manager in a band, and he gave me one of these. I would copy John and Yoko's message of peace and love for the whole world somehow, possibly. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. That's that what I would do. I would figure out some way to do that and pay tribute to them. You know, like maybe say separation is over or something, yeah. you yeah. know, if you want it, happy today from Paul Ill, something oh, like that. I love yeah. that, I love and that. I would strongly recommend that everybody watch Above Us Only Sky. I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot. There's footage of John Lennon recording the Imagine record in his home studio with Klaus Vormann, the, the, his, his friend from Germany that became a bass player, Alan White from Yes on drums. Oh yeah. Uh, Nikki Hopkins, and it's a great studio footage of how a song comes together, right? Right. Above Us Only Sky. That's the third documentary to watch about how studio musicians, they're, they're how they reacted to Imagine, the song Imagine, which is yep. by far, everybody says it's the best song of the 20th century. It, I love that song, yes. Yeah. And so, but anyway, that's a good one to, to get an insight into what a studio musician is. and. You know, the idea of studio musicians getting together to create um, music still exists, mm -hmm. right? After right. we figure out this COVID thing, there, there are some safe distancing sessions that are happening few and far between. But with the, I'll leave you with this, with the advent of digital technology and, and the way music is created now and how musical languages changes, it, 
we, it's not the same. And we have to accept that, that the golden age of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, some into the 90s, what I caught the tail end of it, you know, it's, it's not as, it's not, it doesn't proliferate like it used to. It's not the norm. It's the exception to the rule now. Right. Oh, wow. The other thing that I wanted to say to everybody is that most important thing we can bring to any circumstance that we have, whether it's relational or um, work, collaborative stuff like I've had to do, is a positive mental attitude. Yes. It, you know, how we, the context we create in the room when we walk in the door, you know, I'm bringing, you know, I'm bringing a positive energy to this situation. Yep. That, it's so important. It's so important. The energy we bring with us, you know, mm -hmm. whatever that is. So if you guys are loving what Paul is saying, like I am, check out the show notes for the rest of his bio and how to follow him on social media and contact him if you feel urged to do that or compelled to do that, because Paul and I could talk for hours and hours and hours. In fact, I want to invite you back to talk just about the psycho knot part and the, the music as a therapeutic intervention as its own show, because that project is really amazing. And well, I'll leave, I'll leave you with this. I, I have the good fortune of teaching narrative songwriting in the California prison systems to, to individuals who will be incarcerated for the rest of their days on this planet. And so it's very, I, I can offer everyone, uh, you know, there is, there is a, a, a really measurable empirical healing uh, energy that I've witnessed with non-musicians in, in the most interesting circumstances. People who are uh, LWP is what it's called in that system, life without parole. And they never wrote songs until they were met the people from our jail guitar doors, the organization that I teach in the prisons for. Now we're teaching by distance learning because of COVID. But yeah, we can talk about that someday. That's pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, I think it's very amazing. Very amazing. Thank you so much, Paul, for being on the show and playing your bass. Oh, everything you shared was so rich. Let's do a goodbye bass line. Let's just improvise one. Yeah, do a goodbye bass line. Here's a, here's a goodbye bass line. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. And remember, everybody, to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go let your light shine. Do the right thing from the inside out. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.